Wally Norling was a mentor to us when we started things at our church about almost 20 years ago now. Many of you knew Wally. He was a godly man who taught adjunct for us at Talbot. And he was keeping our church, Grace Evangelical Free Church, alive. He was giving it CPR, which is what he did after he retired. He kept churches that were struggling alive. Uh, Wally said things like, never have anything to prove in ministry. If you're driven by what you have to prove, you're going to hurt people. But one of the things he said I'll never forget is, every minister has wonderful ideals, hopefully, he gets from the New Testament. But he's also got the reality When we seek to serve and minister, we will have the ideals we get from the Bible, but then the reality of our lives here in Southern California that very often do not reflect at all the New Testament ideals. And so Wally said the key for ministers is that we are able to hang on to those ideals, acknowledge the reality where it is, not be discouraged by the gap. And what he said is very often what we ministers start to realize is that what's between the ideals and the gap are all these stinking people, (laughs) right? It's these people who are keeping me from getting this ministry to where it needs to be. If I could just get these people out of the equation, everything would be fine. Forgetting that the people are the ministry, right? The people are what we're here for, and we as ministers, all of us, are the work of God. It's not just getting some, to some ideal with some institution or organization or ministry, but the transformation of God's people who are what's in between that gap. And he said the key is to never lose sight of those ideals, be real about where we are, and then celebrate any steps we take toward those ideals. Work toward them and celebrate them. And that gap is something we've just got to realize. Not despairing by the gap because of the gap, but acknowledging it and then working toward those ideals. If you'd open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 19, we see a massive gap between the ideals of God and the reality of where his people are. We've got to acknowledge the gap or we'll be despairing, discouraged, frustrated. Yeah, there's a gap between who we should be, who we're called to be as God's holy people and where we really are. And Genesis 19 shows us a gut-wrenching gap between where God's people should be and where they are. It's Lot and his daughters in a cave. Let me read our passage together. Genesis 19, verse 30. Now Lot went up out of Zor and lived in the hills with his two daughters, for he was afraid to live in Zor. Now what's, what's crazy about that is he actually pleaded with Abraham to let him move to Zor. How did we get here? How did we get to this situation? Well, Lot, if you remember, was given the option of choosing anywhere he wanted to live by Abraham in a great act of faith by Abraham, and he chose to live right near the border of Sodom. Bad news. And after we're told that, it said this was before God God brought destruction on Sodom. And so we see, okay, this is bad. He chooses to live right near a wicked place and people. And before you know it, he gets in that city. He's living in Sodom, even in the fabric of the society, part of the leadership of the society. And remember the horrible events of Sodom and Gomorrah and the destruction of these wicked cities that have become an emblem of evil and wickedness. He basically has to be dragged out of Sodom to be freed from the destruction that come. And then he could have gone with Abraham, but he says, no, let me just go to this little town, still close to Sodom, not that far away, another bad sign, and he stays close to Sodom. And for some reason, we're not sure the details, he ends up in a cave, no longer with all his possessions, no longer with his impressive entourage that he had, but just two daughters, Two daughters, if you remember, that he actually was willing to sacrifice to make as vulnerable as he could to even be raped instead of his guests in Sodom. Just talk about undermining trust in the family. 
So now he's in a cave. It's as dismal as it can be. And it gets worse. Watch what happens. Verse 31. And the firstborn, he lived in a cave with his two daughters, and the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man on earth to come into us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and did not know when she lay down or when she arose. He did not. Doesn't mean he was passed out, just lost his faculties that badly because of drunkenness. The next day, the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you go in and lie with him that we may present offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger rose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab, offspring of my father. I guess she wasn't trying to hide it. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami, father of my kinsmen. Nor was she trying to hide it, apparently. He is the father of the Ammonites today. I want you to know, no one made me preach this passage. (laughs) I chose to preach this passage this morning. Now, I was assigned it at our church a couple of months ago. And I'm grateful that I was. It's a powerful passage. And it makes me want us to take caution with sayings I hear often like, I'm writing a book right now called 21 Things Christians Should Probably Stop Saying. And one of them is, this is my favorite verse. Or this is my favorite passage. Or this is my favorite book. Now I know what people mean when they say that. They mean God has powerfully used this passage, this verse, this book in my life. Well, let's say that. But when we say my favorite, it sounds like we're talking about ice cream flavors, not the word of God, which is all the word of God. And that's why I think red letter Bibles are a bad idea. What, the father doesn't get red letters, just the son? What's that all about? <laughs> right? So uh, favorite, well, I, and everybody's at time somebody says, this is my favorite verse. I think, well, that's nice. What about the rest? Now, who would pick this passage as their favorite? But I want us to hear from this story. It's a powerful story, and we need to learn from it. What we find out in this story is that even though Lot and his daughters were taken out of Sodom, Sodom was clearly not taken out of Lot and his daughters. And we need to realize that just because we may change our location, just because we may change our station in life, doesn't mean the things that have gotten in us aren't still there. And that's true of good things, too. And so we need to realize that we carry with us things that get in us no matter where we go. And he ends up in this horrible condition of a cave. And it's even worse than Sodom. I, I, we have no indication historically that incest would have ever been tolerated in even Sodom. And please realize these aren't pagan peoples, those sinners out there. These are the people of God we're talking about who have wavered so far from God and his ways that that's where we are. One preacher puts it this way. Righteous Lot was distressed by the sin of Sodom, as we find out in the New Testament, but still taken captive by it. It is possible to be distressed by the world while hanging on to it for dear life. You can destroy a city, but the influence of that city can remain. And we need to realize the effects our experiences have on us. What we give ourselves to takes us captive, sometimes for a very long time. Why is he doing this? We're told the the daughters were fearful. Fear and depression and hopelessness can lead us to do lots of desperate things. Lots of desperate things. And and you can understand, in this context, these women had no future, no security without some sort of offspring 
to care for them. And so they took matters into their own hands the same way Lot did, the same way tragically at times Abraham did, the same way Adam and Eve did in the garden. We will decide good and evil for ourselves. We can't quite trust God here. And this is the pattern we see, Cain killing his brother. And on and on it goes. We know better than God. And so here Lot and his daughters are in a dismal situation. And the first point I want us to take with us today is we with them are a mess. I know we all look good right now, but if we're honest, we're a mess. We were born into a mess. The human race is a mess. The human heart, in spite of what we constantly hear about how good we are, the Bible says, is deceitfully wicked. You can't even understand it. Who can figure it out? If we really understood the depth of our human sin, we wouldn't be surprised when we see evil. We'd be surprised any of us got here safely this morning. If we really understood the depth of human sin, we realize God is keeping a lid on where all of our hearts could go with his grace. The Bible says we all like sheep have gone astray. No one is righteous. No, not one. We're a mess. And let's stop acting like we're not. Even those of us who've been walking with Jesus a long time and have seen growth. I have seen wonderful growth in my life. I want to give God so much credit for the victories and development and the Christ-likeness in my life that has developed. But I'm still a mess. I still do things, say things to my kids, have struggle in prayer where I wonder if I've grown at all sometimes. And so let's not act like we're not a mess. We are. We're a mess. And this shouldn't surprise us. And I think it's especially important to highlight the three big sins that are in this passage. Drunkenness, sexual immorality, and dishonesty. Boy, You know how basketball teams have the big three? I wonder if for sin, this isn't the big three. Uh, Giving our faculties, our self-control away to something like substance of some kind. The Bible is strong about drunkenness and giving ourselves away to forces outside of ourselves that aren't the Holy Spirit. And sexual immorality couldn't be denounced more clearly in the Bible. And deception seems to go all the way in this sinful cocktail that gets us into all kinds of problems. No pun intended, but there it is. Um, These major areas of failings for us are areas the Bible warns us about, and they often go hand in hand. And we need to be vigilant in the areas of self-control and sexual purity and integrity and honesty because of it. We won't learn these things from our culture. We've got to learn them from the Word. And we need to decide to be radically countercultural in these areas. And the second point, we're a mess. The second point, our mess is devastating. And it has a ripple effect for generations. The two children born from this incident become the major thorns in the side of the nation of Israel. The Moabites and the Ammonites are their closest and most vicious enemies. The ones who influence them the most. The sin of the Baal of Peor, which is in Numbers 25, that the Old Testament refers back to over and over again, is this great failure of God's people, is brought about among the Moabites. It's brought about among these people who come from this cave, these two people groups. And sin not only has consequences that are devastating in this context, but in ours as well. I'm sure you can point to sin in your family, maybe for generations, that keeps showing up and having devastating ramifications. We need to realize that sin damages us tremendously. And because we're forgiven, as David was when we repent the way he did in Psalm 51, doesn't mean he's freed necessarily from devastating consequences as his life shows. Great difficulty comes out of our sin, and we need to realize this and never minimize it. Sin has devastating consequences. This has been true all along, and we've seen it through the book of Genesis and through the whole Bible. We've got to see sin for what it is and realize that it is a heartache. My friend Chris Mitchell, who died a couple of years ago after having taught here for just a year. I don't know if you knew Chris, but he was an amazing and godly man. And he said, for most of my life, I've longed to go to heaven 
so that I will be safe from this world. But the longer I live, more and more I long to go to heaven so people will be safe from me. He said, in heaven I'll never hurt anybody again. I long for that day of safety for myself and for others from me, from the damage I continue to do to people in my life. We're a mess, and our mess causes great, great damage and consequences. And so what do we do? What do we do because of this mess in all of this? Well, we flee from it. We hate it. We reject it. We do everything to get away from it. And this needs to start in our own hearts and lives and among those relationships that we have that are closest to us. Like in this story, the family has been devastated by sin, starting with the first family of Adam and Eve. And we need to pay attention to the way we live as a family. My daughter Paige is here. I love my daughter. She's a delight. But she will tell you, I say to us, how can we love people? outside of our family, if we don't love each other well. It's got to start here. How can we be a blessing to others if we're not blessing each other who are in closest proximity? I read a great book a while back by Andy Crouch called The Tech Wise Family. I highly recommend it. And he says this, two great things happen in families, at least families at their best. For one, we discover what fools we are. <laughs> I love that. No matter how big your house it's not big enough to hide your foolishness from people who live with you day after day. Can I get an amen? How many times have I seen on college campuses best friends become roommates and it messes up the friendship? Right? How many times, oh, we're best buds, we're going to room together. Ah, and it just doesn't work because now you're in such close proximity. Oh, you're all laughing. I know because you've seen it. You know what I'm talking about. And yes, Getting together in close proximity brings all kinds of things out of us. Remember, we had these dear friends that we got along with so well, and then we went on a road trip for a month in a van. <gasps> oh, my, I never knew the wife was one of those people who drove. We ever drive with those people? Ah, right. And so I, these little things now are becoming big issues. Crouch goes on, right? Our busyness, our laziness, our sullenness, our short tempers, our avoidance of conflict, our boiling over in conflicts. Living in a family is one long education in just how foolish we can be. Children and adults alike, yes. And yet a second amazing thing happens in families when they're at their best. Our foolishness is seen and forgiven. And it is also seen and loved somehow in the discovery that we're great fools we also begin to develop great wisdom. John Bloom, a writer, puts it this way. Families, immediate and in the local church, can become a crucible of grace, a place where the heat of pressure forces sin to the surface, providing opportunities for the gospel to be understood and applied. And when this happens, the messes become mercies. Is that beautiful? Let's move toward conflict with those in our lives, those we love, those with whom we're in relationship, and then we can start to be a blessing outside. But not if we don't hate sin. Hate it. Resist it. Flee from it. We need to decide to go to war. I hear an awful lot about us being children of God, but the Bible's clear. When you become a child of God, you become a soldier in his army as well. And the bottom line battle is against principalities and powers in high places, and we're all in a war, and we get sucker punched all the time because we don't realize that well enough. We're in a war. We need to see it for what it is and oppose it. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but sexual immor the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Psalm 1, 1 says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. 2 Timothy 2, flee youthful passions. Flee from them. Don't cozy up to them. Don't see how close to the line you can get to youthful passions. Flee from them, my son in the faith, Timothy, Paul says. Flee from them. 
And pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. James says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Listen to Ephesians 8, which I preached on in undergrad chapel last yesterday. Listen to this. You were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Know the difference. The assumption is we don't know the difference. We don't boot up knowing the difference between good and evil. And you know what eventually happens? The Bible says we end up calling evil good and good evil. Exactly what our culture is doing constantly. And we can start doing as well if we take the lead from our culture and not the word of God. We've got to be people who learn the will of the Lord. And this isn't who I marry and what job and what I major in. No, that's how we tend to think. What does he mean by that? Know the will of the Lord by having nothing to do with free, fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shame to even mention what the disobedient do in secret. Everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes light. John puts it this way, do not love the world. Now, God loves the world in the sense of what he made, but the world here, cosmos, is used to describe this, this world that's in opposition to God, this worldly way of living. Don't love it, he says. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, and one of the other chapters of my book, Things We Should Probably Stop Saying, is I know, you know what? It's amazing. People get upset when you go after one of their aphorisms more than things they believe in the Bible sometimes. So I know I may be treading on thin ice. I may have already made enemies with the, my favorite verse thing. But let's talk. Let's talk about it. I like to have spicy conversation because of what we talk about. But, but the other one is, we want to be known for what we're for, not what we're against. As if that's even possible. As if every time you're not for something, you're not necessarily against its opposite. What is the Ten Commandments? Ten things God's against. I wish he could have been more positive. He should have gotten a marketing expert to help him. Right? Don't do this, right? So, see, the Bible's against a lot of things. I don't know what the ratios are in the Bible when it preaches against sin and for righteousness, but I don't know what it is, but it, we've at least got to have a healthy dose of what we're against. You know, I just came across an article last week that Fred Sanders sent me about progressive Christians who don't hold to the same biblical standards, we do at Biola, for instance, who actually have more respect for places like Biola that are clear about what we're for and against than ones who are trying to act like they're not really against anything, even though they're for Jesus, and actually do believe what we believe but don't want to talk about it. Let me just read from that article to you. So this is what we would call a liberal progressive Christian who doesn't hold the biblical ethics anymore, really who says this, these come as you are, everyone is at welcome Christians, are great examples of people who sound nice and allow us to avoid being accused of what we're against. But again, they are simply untrue. And time's up for politely anti-LGBTQ Christians. The, The truth about them needs to be known. And they call it pulling no punches, taking on evangelical fake moderates and phony progressives who refuse to say where they really stand on on issues. And this author says, in short, I'm against the idea that I shouldn't be known for what I'm against. I'd much rather prioritize the truth. Now, he holds a different truth than I would, but he's confident in it and bold in it and let the chips fall where they may. Some people won't like me gasp, he says. Oh, if only Christians had that sort of conviction where we stop acting like junior high kids who so desperately want to be liked. And have people think we're cool. We're children of light, no longer children of darkness. I am for purity, so I'm against pornography. I am for the poor, so I'm against materialism and storing up treasures on earth. I am for truth, so I'm against lying. Isn't that just reality? (laughs) Let's stop acting like you can be for something without being against the things that are opposite those things. Now, there's truth in that expression. We don't want to be only known for what we're against, and that's a problem. But we we don't want to overcorrect in this either. 
And so in the midst of all of this, what do we do? Well, we commit to loving and forgiving even in the mess with the devastating consequences. In the midst of fighting against evil, raging against the darkness, we continue, though, to be loving and forgiving even with our enemies. Jesus says, love your enemies. What? Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. As Jesus is on a cross, he says, Father, forgive them. God always calls us to forgive. This doesn't necessarily mean he calls us to be vulnerable and trust people who haven't re-earned that trust. That's not what I'm saying. It doesn't mean we don't even take out a restraining order if we need to. But what it does mean is we always have a posture of forgiveness, always believes in in God's amazing grace and the power of the gospel to reconcile and heal and restore and bring unity again. He calls us to forgive this horrible, horrible situation with this doctor who abused all these gymnasts. Rachel Denhollander was the woman who, who first called him out for this. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this terrible trial that went on, and 150 women publicly spoke out against him, confronting him in court. The last one was Rachel Denhollander. And listen to what she says to him as he sits in court after he abused her as a kid. In our early hearings, you brought your Bible to the courtroom, Larry, and you've spoken of praying for forgiveness, and so it is on that basis I appeal to you. If you've read the Bible, you carry... You know the definition of sacrificial love portrayed there is of a God himself loving so sacrificially that he gave up everything to pay a penalty for the sin he did not commit. By his grace, listen to this, I too choose to love this way. Wow. She says, Larry, you spoke of praying for forgiveness, but Larry, if you have read the Bible you carry, you know forgiveness does not come from doing good things as if good deeds can erase what you've done. It comes from repentance, which requires facing and acknowledging the truth about what you've done and all its utter utter depravity and horror without mitigation, without excuse, without acting as if good deeds can erase what you've seen in this courtroom today. The Bible you carry says it's better for a stone to be thrown around your neck and for you to be thrown into a lake than for you to have made even one child stumble and you've damaged hundreds. Listen how she concludes. The Bible you carry, Larry, speaks a final judgment where all of God's wrath and eternal terror is poured out on men like you. Should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you've done, the guilt will be crushing. And that is what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet. Because it extends grace and hope and mercy where none should be found, and it will be there for you. Listen to what she says. I pray you'll experience the soul-crushing weight of guilt so that you may someday experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God, which you need far more than forgiveness from me, though I extend that to you as well. That's astounding. That's the best sermon I've heard in a long time. That's just amazing, and that's what we're called to. Jesus sets the example for us in this, and the way we need to really bring this home is to realize that as we realize the world's a mess, and this mess causes devastating consequences, and we need to resist evil with all we've got and go to war with it every morning when we wake up, and still maintain a forgiving, loving attitude and hopefulness in this world. But why can we do this? Because God is always, has been, and always will be at work bringing about his redemptive process and purposes and ends, even in this story. Listen to this. These people who come out of this, we're told in the Bible, have no place among the people of God. But then, in the prophetic literature, the Ammonites and the Moabites, these offspring of Lot's daughters, have a glimmer of hope. Listen to Jeremiah. He says, I will restore the fortunes of Moab in these latter days, declares the Lord. Thus far is the judgment of Moab. Jeremiah 49, 6, he says, afterward, I will restore the fortunes of the Ammonites, declares the Lord. Can you imagine how that sounded to the Israelites? Wait, in your purposes, even the the evil Ammonites and Moabites will, will find a place at your table? What? They must have had a hard time with that and been unable to understand how that could happen. But then we get where? The book of Ruth. And in the book of Ruth, we have this story of this woman whose husband dies, Naomi, and she has a daughter-in-law 
who, who married one of her sons, and Ruth is a Moabite. And she says to Naomi, your God will be my God, and your people will be my people. And this Moabitess becomes part of the people of God in this example of faithfulness and trusting Yahweh, the God of the covenant. This is astounding. This gives us hope. And then where do we finally end up? Listen to the genealogy of Jesus. Before we get to Jacob, the father of Joseph in Matthew 1, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who's called the Messiah, listen to how we get there and who we hear about on the way to Jesus, the Messiah, the son of Joseph and Mary. Matthew 1.1, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah, his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. Tamar. There's a story there. And Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab. There's a story there. A Canaanite prostitute is in Jesus' lineage. And then listen, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. Did you hear that? Ruth is King David's great grandmother. This Moabitess that comes out of this cave situation here. What are we seeing? We're seeing that God does not pull us out of these caves, these symbols of a place of death and darkness and stench. He pulls us out of that, not from a distance, but by entering into it. God enters into the mess and becomes more messy than even this. He becomes a bloody mess for us on a cross. And he does it by entering into our situation and all our sin and taking on our sin. And we see here that the good news of great joy at Christmas goes right through a cave thousands of years before where this horrible scene takes place and the hope of Christmas goes through a cave because God enters into this place of death and darkness and stench and sin and he saves us. He pulls us out of the pits and out of the caves And out of the sin in our lives, he's more opposed to sin than we are. And he solves it with his son entering into it. And he's got in his lineage a Moabite woman. That's just a wonderful way of seeing how God works. Even in this horrible moment, God's at work. And even in your most horrible moments, God's at work. We can't see how in this cave, as we often can't see in the times of our life, But trust that God's at work. If he can take this and work his redemptive promises through a cave where these horrible things are happening, he can redeem whatever's going on in your life. Take heart. Take hope. That's the God we serve. That's who we're thinking about this morning. Genesis 19 is not the last chapter in the Bible. Thank God. But Jesus comes as the Alpha and the Omega, and he brings everything to a glorious conclusion. And we're the people who acknowledge the mess, see the consequences of it, fight it with all we've got, but still remain loving and forgiving and take heart and take hope because God is the God who gives us the ability to be grateful in the midst of all the groaning. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.